Mitchell. Thank you, S, for joining us today. Um, we were chatting a little bit before I actually hit record, and uh, we were talking about the, the lack of support. Can you can you jump back into that? <laughs> oh yeah, I definitely can. Well, thank you for having me, um, and I really appreciate everything you're doing to bring awareness to this type of situation. It's something that I think collectively as deaf care professionals, we don't talk about enough and it's not offered in the training or the learning. And, you know, a lot of it goes on. It's a lot more common than people think. I mean, unfortunately, amongst women, um, I mean, I know hazing and things like that happen to men, especially in their apprenticeships. I'm not trying to take anything away from that, but there is a significant um, difference in the way that certain people are approached compared to others, at least in my experience. Um, with that being said, I do want to preface our interview with the fact that despite everything I've gone through, uh, where I stand today is a place of strength, resilience, passion, and hope because I love what I do. Um, my current employer is phenomenal to me. I got to a place of what I deserve and, um, I didn't leave the business, so, and I have no plans to. Um, you know, I was put on this earth for a purpose, and I think a lot of this is my purpose, and there was a time where I really didn't want it to be, and part of that was because of what I had experienced, right? So when you exist in a toxic space for so long, and you're consistently beaten down and kind of made to believe that, like, maybe there are no other opportunities aside from this one, and I better stick with it because the fear of not having income or losing a job or not being able to find a job really does keep you stuck. And I think when people behave consistently, it does something in our brain that makes us comfortable because we know what to expect, right? Accurate. Unexpected unexpected change keeps us so stuck and so scared because, you know, the grass isn't always greener, right? But I've learned in my time that's true to a point, but you have to be willing to peek over the fence. You know, nobody, nobody deserves to come home from work in tears every day. And, you know, I got to a point where like, I'm representing this firm and they're continuously vilifying me, slandering my name and disrespecting me. Why the fuck would I want to make you money? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's how, how do I sit here in my, in my truth? knowing the way that I'm being disrespected, knowing what I bring to a table, knowing how hard I work, how hard I work to be here. And you just want to th drag me through the dirt. I'm making your family money. Do you not get that? You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. if, if that's the case, if you can't endorse me, then I can't endorse you. Right. <laughs> what got you into the funeral industry? What inspired you to do this? So I love when people ask me this question because I think they're always expecting like this um, profound answer. And unfortunately, as I exist, there isn't one. So um, I had a hard time when I first went into college and, you know, I quickly realized like, oh, people don't try and tell you what to do here. And I don't really love being told what to do. So, you know, stop showing up for class, dropped out, you know, mm -hmm. did what I had to do in the meantime, quickly realized yeah, I got to go back to school. Um, so when I was wrapping up, like basically all my prereqs, I came to a crossroads of, I have to make a choice, right? Um, I had always wanted to be either in art education or art therapy, anything, anything artistically related. But unfortunately, especially in the public school system where I'm from, those are always the first programs to go. And I mean, there's nepotism anywhere, but in the education system, especially in my town, like you have to know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody and anybody in those positions, like they usually kind of stay in them until they're totally done until retirement. So the more I thought of that, I'm like, I have to be a little more realistic. I considered the route of nursing. Um, but for me, that's really the part that makes me sad. And it's not mm -hmm. to say that death care isn't sad. Not every case is a walk in the park. I mean, we know that. But I could never be, I would never want to be responsible for like somebody's discomfort or, or pain. God forbid I do something wrong and it kills them. Whew, that's like a lot of anxiety for me. So I, I kind of inadvertently started researching the funeral business. And the more I did, the more I fell in love with it. Because what stood out to me at first was 
the artistic component, you know, what goes into embalming, dressing, casting, cosmetizing, which very much so is an art. And I don't care what anybody says, not every person is the same. Not everybody's anatomy is the same. Not every shade looks good on everyone. You know what I mean? You really have to put effort into embalming to get a result that's going to be super important in the healing of somebody's grief. So, so I take it you've been around embalmers that just do the same chemical mix every time. Yeah, everybody gets Seen this. That. Everybody gets this amount of fluid, this type mm-hmm. of fluid, and we don't do anything different because this is what has worked for forty years. No, dude. Yeah, that's what turned me off of well, one of the many things that turned me personally off from embalming was that, right, so. right. And and you know what? There's a lot of people out there that have a lot of like differing opinions about embalming. Listen, all due respect, I always I'm a full service funeral director, so I do mm-hmm. everything from embalming, arranging, taking you to church, taking you to the cemetery. We start the journey together, we end it together. Like I'm here Beautiful. to show up for you. So. Yeah. With that being said, like, that's another thing I liked about it because it's never boring. No day, no, no no day is the same, you know? (laughs) And, um, it's really important to me to be able to, I guess, be helpful in some capacity. Um, as far as the spiritual reward I get out of being a part of somebody's healing, healing journey, especially in grief is like insurmountable. Um, you know, the accolades are great. But every funeral does take a little part of my soul with it. And some days are harder than others. And that's the whole thing, too. When I first went into the business, like my first two weeks, somebody had made a, a really, really, um, looking back on it, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? A yeah. really, um, like, offhanded comment. And, like, right out of the gate. Like, I, might, I, I just started my apprenticeship. It was, like, two weeks in. And someone says to me, you know, like, obviously, like, you're a bubbly person. And I don't know why you think you'd be able to be in this business. Don't think you're going to go into arrangement and be able to be that way, because people are not going to like that. And, you know, that sticks out in my mind, uh, Mm -hmm. almost eight years later, and I have chosen to be myself every single day and every single piece and every single arrangement. And it's worked out really well for me. So excellent. Um, I, I'm authentically myself with my families, and I think that really helps them. It brings the humility back to it and the kind of reminder that we're not these robotic people in suits, don't care. Like, I want to be here to help you, and I'm going to show it. And especially if I have to bury in people in, in a family, like, in people's family, like, more than one time. Like, the second time, I probably spent time with that person, you know? So, yeah, I'm crying with you. I feel this with you, you know? I'm going to and talking about this with my own family because I need a place to put it. I'm going to my therapist and talking about the cases that were really difficult for me. Yes. You know what? The hardest part about it for me at this point is, yeah, I can show up for you in our time together, but there's a point in time where you have to leave me and you have to go out in the world without this person that you love so much. And I'm so sorry for that, you know? Yeah. So, but long story short, um, I basically kind of just fell into it, but as there was a time where I kind of, people, strangers would tell me like, you're exactly where you're meant to be. Mm -hmm. I believe that now I believe that now I didn't for a long time, Mm -hmm. but like I said, like everything I've gone through, all the tough times, all of the abuse, the bullying, whatever you want to call it. I would do it all exactly the same way, knowing what I know in this moment and where it's gotten, it's where it's gotten me to. I, you know, I have the same sentiment about my career is as rocky as it has been to even call it a career, (laughs) but (laughs) um, let's get into it. Tell me, you know, what happened? What do you want to talk about? So, I think the, like, the first thing that was difficult to overcome, I, I come from a familial background. My parents never made me or my sister feel like we couldn't do something because we were female. Like, that just didn't exist, right? So, Excellent. coming into adulthood, I, I started my apprenticeship, I was 22. I was a 22-year-old girl. And uh, to look back on that, it's like, wow, like, I was a baby. I was a baby, you know, I was 22, every, all my friends were going out doing their thing away at college. And here I am like 
3 a.m. and bombing a body, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not sitting in an IHOP coming out of a bar. I'm, I'm, I'm in a prep room and bombing a body at 3 a.m. Um, so it's like what, what, what I struggled with in the beginning personally was, you know, for me, a bad day was not a flat tire. And, you know, as we develop, especially through our early 20s, a bad day is like so different for everybody. So yeah. I had to come into an acceptance where um, for some people, a day is a, is a, a bad day is a flat tire and that's OK. It's just not mine. So instead of allowing me and there was a time where I did allow that to make me better. I think I really closed off a lot of people, which Sorry, guys, but appreciate your understanding. Um, um, I really kind of shut out a lot of people and kind of started down this, I guess, phase of depression. Let's call a spade a spade on top of dealing with everything else. So, like, the hardest thing to assimilate to in the beginning was the blatant um, misogyny. I remember, like, getting out of a hearse and I could hear, like, grown men, whether they were working on top of the hospital that I was at or they were standing in line at the car wash I was at or, you know, whatever situation it was, I would hear them say, that's a girl, that's a girl. And I'd be like, yeah, we do this too. Like, why is that so hard to wrap your head around, yeah. you know? mm-hmm. And then on the other side of that coin, um, there's always going to be a positive probably to anything that I may, may uh, talk about that's hard because on the other side of that coin, I have had just as many grown men tell me like, it's really nice to see a woman in your position. You bring such a light to this, you know, and I will say in my experiences, families are a lot more forthcoming with me than they have been with my male counterparts. Like my preceptor and I made a great team um, and I'm, eternally grateful for everything he's provided me with. He's a great person. I would do anything for him. Um, He, like, I would watch him with families and I would come in and they'd start just, just telling me things that I didn't necessarily need to know that he didn't necessarily need to know, but it was what they needed in that moment. Right. I think women Mm -hmm. have a better capacity to kind of recognize what people need in the moment rather than like the grand scheme of the experience. You know what I Mm -hmm. mean? You know, if you're apprehensive about like your shitty sister coming to your dad's funeral because she didn't do anything (laughs) for him and you need to talk to me about that right now, I can hold space for that. Whereas like, I think there are some people who just don't, they can't, they can't go there. And like, listen, don't get me wrong. Like I, I, I always tell my family, because there's always, there's crap in every family, right? Like, I think that's the most common misconception amongst people that really need us, is to, like, apologize for, like, their shitty family member, which, between you and I, and I guess whoever is listening at this point, is we already know the shitty family member before you point them out to us. Like, it becomes routine, you know what I mean? I know who's going to be the problem, and I know how I'm going to have to navigate them. But, like, Mm -hmm. it's so sad to watch families, like, kind of carry that extra stress on a stressful experience. So I always tell people, I'll be like, listen, we can only control where we are. Don't worry about that. We're going to have a beautiful funeral. And you know what? If something happens, I'll handle it or blame it on me, you know? That's their thing, too. Like, you have to be willing. Unless you've ever really needed somebody like us, I don't think you realize what we bring to the table, you know? Yes. So, yeah. Sometimes we're the punching bag. Sometimes we're going to carry we're going to carry the burden of the person who has an issue with this. And even though it may even though that flower piece may not have been my decision or my direction or maybe the outfit wasn't something I chose, you can say, "Listen, well, the funeral director said this is the way it should be because it, it eliminates the burden for anything extra. You know, this is hard enough. So it's counterproductive for me to make you feel more uncomfortable. Absolutely. Um, and that's something I've learned over time. I think being so uncomfortable um, as far as like, again, like I'm in a much better space now where I'm appreciated and valued and like, this is not a reflection at all of them. And if any of them are listening, like I want them to know how much I appreciate them because they know what I've been through. And they've yeah. also yeah. had to kind of adjust in the last year or so that I've been there as far as like, you know, me being defensive or maybe like used to a certain kind of treatment and like totally oh, yeah. guard by the opposite. Like it creates, it, it really does like, it really does fuck with your head. Like you don't realize like how much of it is truly Stockholm syndrome until you're Mm -hmm. in a better space where you're kind of free to be yourself. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, um, the biggest thing was the misogyny, which still does happen to me now. I mean, it happened to me just the other day, but I'm at a place in my life where like, I can kind of look at somebody, especially if they have 
nothing to do with like the case I'm working on or it's like an offhand comment from like a grown ass dude or whatever. Like I have no problem now being like, bro, like go fuck yourself. Like I don't care what you think, you know? Yeah. When you need me, if that's the way you feel about women in this business, Mm. you know, because I have worked with just as many men who I have ran circles around. Yeah. And, you know, I know part of that is burnout, but I think that's also why some people either feel threatened by me or maybe like, well, who, who the fuck does she think she is? Because I'm very yeah. self-aware and I've had to be because of what I've gone through. So with that yeah. being said, um, the misogyny is a big one, but like that's easy to handle once you become secure in yourself. You know, I'm not the same person I was at 22, but it was, I, I guess it was like a shock to me because my parents didn't create that space for my sister and I, like my sister's like, my sister's a friggin' warrant officer in the Coast Guard. You know, she's career military. She's a badass too. Um, and, and to have to experience that, like literally firsthand, listen, dude, if it's 2 a.m. And, and I'm the one that's on a house call with you and we got somebody like flat on the bathroom floor in between the toilet and the bathtub, which we've all been there and it sucks. Mm-hmm. Um, who's there to help you? Me. So you better put a little bit of your faith in me. And guess what? By the end of it, you're going to be tired. So I know I'm going to have to take the heavy end. You're welcome. Uh huh. <laughs> but I'm good for it in that moment. You know what I mean? Like, it's so frustrating. Yeah. So, yeah. um, but as far as like di- internal stuff, so I've only ever worked for family owned, uh, firms, which <laughs> can be a blessing and a curse. Yeah. So like, I see both sides of it because I've experienced both sides of it. And I'll be honest mm-hmm. with you. I don't, I don't think I would make it as a corporate cutie. You know, I am who I am. Yeah. There's a lot more freedom in a family owned firm, just as far as like, you know, the way that you can kind of like banter with, within colleagues, as far as like in my state, like, like as far as like CEUs and things like that, like we don't have to go through all the training and like whatever. And, and I also like, I prefer family owned because they don't segregate you. Right. Like, so I'm not just an embalmer and a ranger, whatever, like I'm allowed to see things through. And that's really important to me. Um, <clears throat> I did work for a firm who, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities I had there, but it turned out that like, it just was never <laughs> on my best day. I was never good enough. And, and they weren't real secretive about like, let me know that. <laughs> Um, Mm -hmm. and it, and it all stems from a place of just blatant insecurity. And, um, I, I don't understand why I would be expected to change who I am when I would never ask somebody to change who they are. Um, and if the feedback from the public is this girl is hitting all these marks, she brings so much to the table. She has this talent why are you still so angry with me that you blatantly want to vilify my character? And I can understand now that it comes from a place of like insecure misery because I've, I've, I've grown through the fact that I have to accept it for what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. It really never had anything to do with me. And as much as it hurt going through it and I didn't deserve it, it was always about them. It was never about me. Um, Unfortunately, it's put a strain on a lot of of important relationships in my life. Um, Again, I was very, very close to the person that kind of showed me the way in this business and taught me a lot of what I know as a funeral director and embalmer. And again, I'm I'm insurmountably grateful for that person. And and there really is nothing I wouldn't do for him. Um, He's a great person. And and I do think that he deserves better, too. Um, And I hope that he comes to know that someday. And that all comes from a place of love. I experienced like pretty awful sexual harassment and not at the hands of men, at the hands of grown women, like in their fifties and sixties, um, blatant accusations about me and people I worked with, whether it was the manager or one of the door people, or, you know, like she's a whore, she's this, she's doing that without any proof. Like, so Mm -hmm. like, I feel like it's a super bold accusation to make about somebody unless like you've actually seen somebody inside them. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like Mm -hmm. why, why, why would you even? You don't know. Yeah, you don't know. And also like, why do you fucking care? Like that's weird to me too. So, um, you know, it just got to a place and this was over years. This was over years. Like it started like pretty much 
I would say six months to a year into my internship. And I think part of that is because like, I do have the capability to get along peacefully or cohesively with most people. And it, and it's a gift. It is, but it's a gift that's useful in this business too. Like you're not, I mean, that's what I think too. Like we're in a people like focused service profession, right? Like, like, like mm-hmm. the customer is always right mentality. And, oh, yeah. but, but, but throw on like intense emotional fragility on top of that and things get really fucking weird. Right. So, but even so, like, yeah, you're going to do what you have to do, but it doesn't mean that you're going to enjoy every family that comes across like your desk. Right. Like there are some times where like, you kind of do think to yourself, listen, best of luck to them, but I really can't wait to watch the vault, the vault lid close on this situation. Cause I got to go, you know, <laughs> like it's, I've served my purpose, you know, we have to, we have to part ways, but, um, but yeah, so just, and it got to a point where like, they would say it like publicly, like to people that we knew, um, whether it was from like local organizations or even just like people that we knew from local bars or like, and, and I found myself being approached by like people who really didn't even know me that well and saying like, Hey, like, just so you know, like they're saying this about you and -and so-and-so or you and this person, or this was said and it got repeated to this person's like wife. Like why, (laughs) why would Mm -hmm. you do that? Like, why would you even do that? I work for your firm. I represent the name of your firm. And this is where you're putting me in this space. Like Mm -hmm. how, how dense are you? Like, it's also a reflection of your firm, if that's what you truly believe. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's, it's blatant defamation of my character, you know? Yeah, anything to make them look superior. Right. And I appreciate everybody who always kind of brought it to my attention because it always said more about my character than theirs. But like, and then they would know that like, we would find out and then they would just like, like not talk to you. Like, so, mm-hmm. so, and I was asked so many times, like, please don't say anything. Please don't say anything. Please don't say anything. Please don't say anything. And I'm like, and I didn't out of respect for the person who was also involved because I understood like he had more riding on the situation, but like looking back on it now, like I should have, like, I wish I did, but again, hindsight is twenty twenty because it was affecting my life just as much as it was affecting the other, the other party. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And it was putting me in a bad spot and it has continued. Like, I have separated myself from that situation over a year ago and you want to know what there have th- there have been things that have occurred even after that have been brought to my attention. Um, I know for a fact that I've been followed because I've caught them. <laughs> um, mm. Pictures were taken outside of my residence. Um, I know somebody reached out to like my new employer and, and made the same accusations. Unfortunately, my new employer was like, I don't know what this has to do with her employment here. But my whole thing is why, why are you so bothered by my existence? Is it because Mm -hmm. I didn't accept your shitty treatment and I left you before you could leave me? You know, it's, it's a very weird thing. And it got to a point where like one of the final straws was like somebody important in our world had died and we were at their funeral and you know, like this death was going to affect the whole outcome of this business. Um, uh, model, which if that's what you want to call it, whatever, <laughs> it was going to directly affect this entire setup. And it made me feel very unsafe. And sure enough, the behavior following this funeral for this person was so disgusting. It really kind of made me stop and be like, this is not it. Like I could no longer disrespect myself by like putting myself in this position. So I have to shit or get off the pot. And yeah. You know, like the actions leading up to the funeral, the actions at the funeral, like I came to find out that these things are being said to me at this funeral. We're at a funeral for somebody that we know who died pretty horribly. It was a really shitty situation. And you're still worried about me. Uh That's not normal. That's not normal. At all. Like, so then it got back to me what was said. And I was like, you know what? I'm fucking done. And, um, I put my feelers out there and I was fortunate to know somebody who was an apprentice at my new place of employment and he was very supportive and, you know, set me up for an interview and it all worked out, but it's just like to look back on like the blatant and, and that's another thing too. That's really, really hard. Like 
people will sit here listening to this and say, well, why didn't she do anything about it? Why didn't she bring it to the attention of somebody else? Their name is on the building. When you don't have that familial name and you're just the funeral director and embalmer that's there to make them all this money. By the way, shout out to any like family owned businesses in this moment. Please keep in mind, the people that work so hard for you are the ones making you your money. They're the ones securing your generational wealth. Do better. Do better. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, you need us more than we need you. And I don't think we realize that. And the moment that you do, the moment that you say enough is enough, I, this is not good for me. You need me more than I need you. And if you think you can do it without me, do it. It becomes very freeing and everything works out the way it's meant to. And it brings you into a space of a higher awareness. The things that have happened to me will not happen to me again because I won't, I won't, I will never allow it. Mm -hmm. And as awful as some of it was, I'm proud of the strength that it's built in me. You know what I mean? Like, that's my whole thing. I feel like I've talked to a lot of people who like have left this business because of the way people were awful to them or bullied them or pushed them out. And realistically, let's call a spade a spade. Yeah, I was blatantly pushed out of my old job. Okay. Yeah. I just yeah. have the I just have the wherewithal to recognize that this was not okay and find the strength to leave it. Mm-hmm. But that was never going to stop. It probably was only going to get worse. And honestly, it did even when I left it which that's Mm -hmm. weird in itself. Like imagine being me and like, I'm like a little weirdo, you know, like I'm like a little hippie girl, like driving around in my Jeep, doing my thing, like going to work, like bopping around, listening to the dead. Imagine being me. And like, you're so bothered by my existence. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy to me. It's so crazy to me. Um, and Mm. And it's sad for them, not for me. Right. So that's why as soon as I saw this opportunity, I'm like, you know what? Like I want to speak on this because I feel like I've talked to so many people who have allowed the toxicity of this business to diminish their light. And it makes me so sad because the, the world needs people like us. The world needs people like us that have the capacity to hold this space for people that are hurting so badly. You know, it's not a perfect career. It's hard. It's sometimes gross. It does. It does require a lot of, you know, pouring from your own cups and hopefully you have support systems at home that understand that like sometimes other families need you before your own does and and you got to do what you got to do but like if you have the capability to provide this service to people there's a reason for that and it makes me so sad to know so many people who have allowed insecure miserable people miserable people who will always be that way who probably don't even have the capabilities that you have like keep in mind A lot of, like, in my experience, none of the family was licensed. So you truly did need me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, it's just, it's so sad. Like, why do we allow people to make us feel so small when we do something that's so great for, like, the betterment of others? Yeah. And I can sit there and say that in this moment. But it's because I've given myself the opportunity to allow every negative thing to make me feel like I need to be stronger, better, and more resilient. Because never again will somebody be allowed to treat me that way. Excellent. And I'm just, yeah, you know, like, and it, like, it's, it's just super sad to me. Like, even like, actually... The one person who sent me this link who like kind of was like, Hey, like I heard about this. I think you'd be good for it. She, she was in, she was in the business too. And like, just, she was treated so awfully by like the firm and again, another family owned firm that she worked for, um, that like, she just, she left it behind. And like, she has such a poor like image of what funeral service is. And it makes me so sad because like, you know, I've worked so hard to get to where I'm at. Like we all have in our own ways. And we all know if you've ever gone through it, like, especially being an apprentice under a fucking funeral director that comes from an old school mentality. It's rough, man. Like, they oh, yeah. oh yeah. Rigor, whether you're male, <laughs> female, whatever, like it's rough. It's not, it's not fun. <laughs> but like when you do get to the other side of it and you're able, you know, you know, you give something to somebody 
that's so invaluable you know like when I hear things like she doesn't look sick anymore or you've made this so much easier or I don't know how I would have done this without you like it makes my purpose so worth it and nobody Mm -hmm. can take that from me excellent you know you can say what you want about me like there's there's a lot of versions of me that exist out there and that's okay because I know what the best version of me is and like (laughs) I don't really care what anybody else thinks. <laughs> Dude, talking to, or hearing you today has been better than the last therapy session I had. I like everything Aww. that you're saying resonates so deeply within me and my experience as well. Aww, some of the stuff and just I know it's gonna it's gonna touch a lot of people that listen. And see, that's exactly why I brought this podcast to a reality. Like I, I'm not a seasoned podcaster, so some of my episodes are gonna be like Oh, she's so awkward, but this one has <laughs> flowed really well. And Aww. it's just like so many people over the years in my inbox are just like, yeah, this is yeah. happening. What do I do? Yeah. And then it, it turns to, should I get into this business? And I'm just like, well, let me be honest with you. Um, there are goods and there are bads. And yeah. it really it's, it's your own experience is going to dictate whether or not, you know, this is actually the thing for you or not. Absolutely. And it sounds and- like you're in the right place. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I definitely am. And like I said, like, I'm, I'm so grateful for that, because a lot of that has come from support of like, my my colleagues now and, and ownership now and my family. But going back to what you were saying, like, that's the that's the other thing, man, like, I tell, and you're right, there are pros and cons to this. And you know what, there are pros and cons to anything. It's just ours are a little bit heavier because of what the subject matter is right so anytime somebody kind of approaches me and says you know i really want to get into this line of work okay that's great but i'm going to tell you right now get yourself a good therapist and Mm -hmm. make sure make sure you know how to do every single thing so that you never have to ask anybody to do anything for you and that sounds that sounds like a toxically independent statement but i actually mean it from a place of like knowing what i know now like make sure you know how to do everything because people will throw things in your faces, especially men, if you Mm. don't know how to do them. And I'm going to be blatantly honest with you as women in this, in this industry, we do automatically have to work a little bit harder. Is it right? No. Is it wrong? No, but it is rewarding. You know, um, it kind of is what it is. Like you, you always do have to work a little harder to prove yourself and listen, like I'm a solid bitch. Okay. Like I'm like an Amazonian. I'm like five nine on a good day. I I like I'll still wear a heel. I'm solid, you know, I'm I'm thick, I'm I'm curvy, whatever you want to call it. Like I'm strong. So uh-huh. but so I can't imagine what it's like for like my short queens out there, you know? Like uh, and, and <laughs> listen, I've seen a girl four eleven, like one ten, manhandle a two hundred and fifty pound man. Like it, it, we can do it. You find oh, yeah. a way to do it. And like how dare mm-hmm. you not even give us the chance sometimes. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like, I'll never forget it. And like, my, my, my preceptor kind of learned this the hard way. We went on a house call once and the cop was just like a blatant asshole, like just so blatant. Gentleman like passed away in like his RV and he, and he was a substantial gentleman. Not anything I haven't done before, believe it or not, like between whether you live in an RV, a home, a trailer, whatever, like, however you die, we will figure it out. We're trained to do yeah. that. That's our purpose. Mm-hmm. Right. So <laughs> We go, the cop blatantly disregards me and he's like, she's not going to be able to do it. And my preceptor followed suit and I was pissed. I was so pissed (laughs) because Mm. we had worked together long enough to know like, hey, I know what she's capable of. And like, I think in the moment we just wanted to get it done, whatever. But like, it was a very long, quiet hearse ride back to the funeral home. And when he finally, (laughs) when he, and he knew, he knew what he did when he finally Mm -hmm. had, um, had the, the, the goal to ask me, I like lost it. And I was like, you blatantly allowed that man to dismiss me. And guess what? Who's here to help you move this body on this table now? Not his ass my ass so if you think i can't best of luck do it your fucking self <laughs> and it was oh. like a little bit and it was like a little bit karmic i mean we move on and he apologized and he and he and he he wrecked he there have been times even like um if we ever talked about it after the fact like that he'd be like yeah but, you know and like sometimes they have to but like my whole thing in this is stand in your truth. You know if you want to be here or you don't. Just don't let anybody tell you whether you should be here or you're not or you deserve to be or you don't, right? And 
if you're going to immerse yourself in this experience, I want you to know that I'm proud of you. I walk with you and invest in yourself because you're going to be pouring into a whole lot of other cups, but yours needs to be full in order to do that. And therapy does provide a space for that. If, you know, I also like wanted to go to therapy because of like this depression and anxiety that that experience did trigger in me and it did. But once I did, and I was sitting there like talking about the hard days, talking about the cases that like do have a space in my brain that I can't unsee. Um, I was like, wow, like, yeah, I wish somebody would have told me this in mortuary school. Like, cause people, people, and I think even when you first go into it, right, it's hard to really immerse yourself in the experience until you experience it. So I think people have this idea of death as like this, like, oh, hospice bed, like cozy blanket, going to shut my eyes and not wake up. Yeah. I wish everybody was that lucky. Yeah. I genuinely do. They don't tell you about the kids who have been clean for this last year and doing so well. And they use and they don't wake up. And their parents are so shocked because they didn't even know that they were using again. Or they don't tell you about the 21 year olds that were out and they drank too much and their car went off road and they can't be viewed because they hit the windshield and how many times did you get in the car with your friends and you probably shouldn't have and you were just lucky and they don't tell you about the girls who are suffering so badly because of the way they've been treated that they think their only out- outlet is to hang themselves and they don't tell you about the people who have been married 65 years And their spouse is gone and their spouse did everything. They did all Mm -hmm. of the balancing of the checkbooks. They did all the shopping. And now you have to write me a check for this funeral and you don't even know how. Like, you know what I mean? There's so much more that goes into it than like the negative aspects that people choose to project, especially Mm -hmm. the way they speak on us as individuals. You know, believe it or not, everybody, we do not make the money you think that we do. (laughs) we are grossly underpaid and undervalued all that money is is going to the big corporations it's going to the owners some of who truly deserve it like my owner now she is the most generous person ever and she Mm -hmm. treats me so well and everybody deserves that and those opportunities are out there but I think that we have to love ourselves a little bit more and respect ourselves a little bit more than the public thinks that we should Um, I feel like, especially death care, we get this kind of, and and it's a cultural thing, right? Like we live in a very death denying culture, but guess what? We're going to pay bills and we're going to die. And that sucks, but there's a lot of good that happens in between. Mm -hmm. So for somebody like us, like you, you are going to need us. And I know I, I try to make a joke out of it. I feel, I say to people sometimes, like everybody should know a good bartender and good funeral director and you're good to go. (laughs) you know (laughs) but like I love it but as far as you being able to resonate with my story I just first of all I just want to say like I'm sorry because I know what it feels like to have to go through the really difficult aspects of this business and I'm sorry for anybody who's ever been made to feel like they weren't good enough or you know the sideways comments or the rumors or the things that were really intentionally designed to make you feel less than who you are on top of having to deal with the stress of death and dying every day on -hmm. top of having to hold space and carry the emotional energy for others that need you so badly for uh, for strangers that you want to show up so badly for you know like fuck man Uh, it's just (laughs) it's a it's a it's a lot it's a lot when you sit there and you really like And you really think about it, but um, I'm just really grateful to be sitting here in this moment with you and being allowed to kind of speak freely on it and unapologetically. And you know what? There are people that if if this does get aired, of course, I'm going to share it. And there are people that are going to know me that hear it. And you know what? Good. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Enjoy. You know, I appreciate your bravery. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate you allowing me this space to be brave. Thank you. Because that takes just as much a leap of faith. And I'm totally here for that. Awesome.